there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. In a California hospital, patients are mysteriously dying on the graveyard shift. Their internal organs are paralyzed as they slowly suffocate. The deaths devastate families searching for answers. The death toll climbs, and rumors and innuendo point to murder. Police must rely on science to stop an angel of death. In this program, some of the names of the participants have been changed, as well as the name of the hospital. In the hospital's intensive care unit, doctors struggled to keep Trisha Johnson alive. Her husband, Larry, stayed by her bedside. She had been in the ICU for days. Doctors believed the worst was finally behind her. Around 3 o'clock AM, he went to get a cup of coffee. As he left his sleeping wife's side, he had no way of knowing it was the last time he would see her alive. Only moments after he walked out of her room, Trisha's vital signs began to plummet. The nurse's station was alerted she was in full arrest. The trauma team rushed to Trisha's room. Her heart had stopped. When Larry returned, he saw the doctors surrounding his wife. There was nothing else they could do. She was dead. Respiratory therapist Bob Baker had become accustomed to sudden deaths in the ICU. We do work around a lot of emergencies, a lot of death, a lot of sadness. We've had patients that we thought were stable, and uh, all of a sudden they died. The staff at the ICU worked with patients who were on the edge between life and death. They're in a very fragile state. We're there to monitor the life support systems they're on and care for them. Many of them, we stabilize them, and they're, they're very predictable. And uh, then there's the other group of patients that are very unstable. Some of the patients were placed in the ICU to recover for a few days after routine surgery. John Schwartz was admitted to ICU after he had his hip replaced. His granddaughter, Mary Nichol, was grateful his recovery was going so well. His prognosis was he's going home in four days. It was the holiday weekend. It was a Friday, and they wanted him to go home on Tuesday. Schwartz had been restrained, so he didn't re-injure his hip. When a nurse went to check on Schwartz later that night, he found him on the floor. 
It seemed he had struggled free of his restraints. The code rang out, and all the staff on duty rushed to Schwartz's aid. I got air, Doc. He was healthy, and he just needed rehabilitation. You know, using you learning to walk again on with a new hip, and that's all it was. He didn't have anything else wrong with him. The doctors, nurses, and respiratory care specialists did all they could, but it was not enough. Receive CPR. Give him a milligram of epi, please. Schwartz died 15 minutes after he was found. Mary Nickel was shocked. Let's call it 137. I wasn't ready for it. I had no inclination that he was going to pass because he was healthy. He had a good heart. It was extremely unusual for someone to die after a routine hip replacement. Schwartz's sudden death seemed especially odd. A nurse checked on him just an hour before. No one could explain how he escaped his restraints. The rising number of strange deaths bothered the respiratory therapists as well. No one was certain whether something was wrong or if the deaths were just a coincidence. Over the next months, the ICU continued treating a large number of patients. When Sarah Ascari was rushed to the hospital, she was having trouble breathing. But now she was off the respirator and stable. This particular patient had a very severe lung disease, but she was improving to the point where she could go home. We had her on a... Um, what we call a BiPAP. She didn't need that anymore. She was getting better. But Sarah Ascari would never make it home. At 4.10 a.m., her respiration rate suddenly shot up. Four minutes later, she stopped breathing. Then her heart stopped. The patient had a do not resuscitate order, so the staff could not make any attempt to revive her. Sarah Ascari was dead. Okay. Let's just get her prepared. Um, I'll call the resident to pronounce her. I'll call the attending. If you could put the family in the waiting room so we can have a conference and just know. It was a big surprise to me to find out that she had all of a sudden died. It was another sudden, unexplained death of a patient who seemed to be recovering. Something about Ascari's death didn't seem right. The strange deaths concerned Bob Baker. His suspicion grew when he came upon a used syringe with a vial of drugs taped to it in one of the hospital's storage rooms. Well, I don't know. According to procedure, this isn't he thought it might belong to one of the labs, but they told him they didn't keep anything in that storage room. They're never supposed to be sitting out. When I found out that it didn't belong to the Bronx lab, I thought, well, maybe somebody's abusing. This was a violation of procedure. Narcotics were kept in a locked refrigerator. This is starting to sound serious. I just thought, OK, this is another piece to the puzzle. Baker went to talk with the other respiratory therapists. If one of them was abusing drugs, he wanted to get it out in the open. Found a used syringe, vial of morphine tape to it up in the equipment room. His coworkers thought it might have been an oversight and dismissed it. Baker wasn't so sure.
Throughout this entire time, Jean Coyle was a frequent patient at the hospital. Seeing her through her many hospital visits was her daughter, Michelle Elmore. She started having more and more breathing problems and more frequent visits to the hospital. And um, she would get breathing treatments. Each time she was short of breath, she would call the staff. Her hand seldom left the call button. Ma'am, please stop pressing the button. I'm going to take care of it. The nurses are on their way. Are they going to bring my pillow? Yes, they're going to bring your pillow. My mom would get frightened about her breathing, and she felt more secure being at the hospital when she couldn't breathe. At 2.05 AM, Jean's blood pressure dropped to zero. Minutes later, she went into respiratory arrest. All right, I need some ventilations here, just not breathing. back quickly. Within 40 minutes, she was stable and well-oriented. I got a call from the hospital late at night. I was shocked as I had just talked to her and she was fine before that. I asked the nurse what had happened. Did she have a stroke or a heart attack or something? What caused that? And she said that they didn't know the cause. It just happened. Mom, how are you doing? Michelle's mother explained what had transpired. Mom told me that she had um, felt funny that evening and she couldn't breathe. So she pushed the button for the nurse and um, she remembers waking up to be in, being resuscitated by uh, Mr. Efren Saldivar, who was the respiratory therapist. The next morning, Efren Saldivar took the blood sample to the lab for testing. Just sit down. Baker tested it to measure the amount of oxygen in her blood at the time of her arrest. Her oxygen levels were normal. This was highly unusual for someone who had suffered a heart attack and nearly died. The strange events at the hospital continued to concern Baker. Jean Coyle's attack occurred on Efren Saldivar's shift. He was a um, kind of a bad luck guy, you know, was Efren on, you know, because it's bad luck because patients die when he's on. The next morning as he was leaving, Baker got some startling news from another respiratory therapist named Everett Weir. Well, she was. We're walking out to the, the car and we were talking about golf and um, he says, oh, you know that patient, uh, Efren did that, killed her. I know about Efren and his magic syringe, his magic syringe, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. He told Baker rumors were going around Saldivar killed one of his patients. To go in and kill a patient with, um, by using a magic syringe uh, just didn't seem very real to me. No, no, hang on a second. See, I've been hearing all these rumors about you in the hospital, but I haven't been listening to them. Don't look at her, look at me. My concern was with exactly what was Efren doing. It made me mad that he would uh, have anything to do with my patient at all because I didn't like his therapy and I didn't like him. Baker told Saldivar to stay away from his patients. Understood? Baker decided he had to do something. 
I heard it frequently enough. And it was just shortly after I had been told about my patient up in uh, CCU that somebody, that uh, Efron had killed my patient. It was just a little while after that that I said, you know what, this, this sounds serious. We need to bring this to somebody's attention. In April of 1997, Baker went to his boss and told him about the rumors. I said, uh, in short, uh, people are saying that Efren's killing his patients. They told me that he killed this one particular patient in CCU, and I could get you the name if you need it. Baker had made a serious accusation, but the idea someone was killing patients in the hospital seemed impossible to believe. A string of unexpected deaths at a California hospital sparked rumors that one of the respiratory therapists had a magic syringe. The rumors all centered around one man, Efren Saldivar. To try and confirm or refute the rumors, hospital officials tallied the deaths on Saldivar's shifts over the past year. They compared them to the number of deaths at other times, but found nothing statistically unusual. Respiratory therapist Bob Baker had brought the rumors to the hospital's attention. They tried to match up the days that uh, Efren was working and did more patients die that night than when he was off. There was no uh, big difference or big uh, increase in patient deaths. They just dropped it at that point and said, well, you know, there's nothing to it. The hospital could find no link between any of their employees and the deaths. The ICU remained busy. Myrtle Brower was admitted after coming down with pneumonia. She was being cared for by her great niece, Vicki Lowry. When we took her to the hospital, we figured she'd be home in a couple weeks. I expected to bring her home for her birthday. After several days in the ICU, she suddenly stopped breathing. But her heart continued to beat. She was slowly suffocating. The puzzling deaths were difficult for the families to accept. When you care about your loved one, you bring them into the hospital, you expect them to be taken care of. You go home that night knowing that they're safe and being taken care of by professionals. And you take solace in knowing that life is sacred to the people who work in that institution. And we're going to do everything we can to help your relative and care for them. Hospital officials were aware of the rumors that something strange was going on, but did not have enough information to do anything about it. Hi. That all changed when an administrator received an anonymous call. A man claimed a lady friend on the hospital staff told him a respiratory therapist was helping patients die. The man refused to reveal his friend's identity, but told the administrator to look at Efren Saldivar. The administrator asked the caller for his name, and he told her it was Jeff Broden. All right, all right, thank you. Hospital officials went to the police. Glendale police officer John McKillop. I got a call from the chief's office. Come to the office, we have a situation that we have to uh, discuss. You don't get invited to the chief's office to discuss a case normally. It's a, uh, I knew there was something, something major going on. Hospital administrators related what Jeff Broden told them. The officers advised the officials to take Saldivar off their work schedule for a few days while they investigated. Police suspected Broden may have an ulterior motive. Detective Anthony Fuchsia ran a background check. When somebody's making an allegation that uh, people are being killed, uh, we want to know whether or not these individuals who are, who are making these comments, you know, are, are of good moral character. We ran Jeff's background uh, through the computer system and found out that he had a pretty extensive criminal history. He was arrested for attempted murder. He was arrested on some theft charges, narcotics possession charges. So he's familiar with the criminal justice system, and he's, he's got a criminal mindset. He may have cooked up this story to extort money from the hospital. Detective Fuchsia and his partner, Will Curry, located their informant. Uh, 
claims over at the hospital. But Broden changed his story. He told them everything was a big misunderstanding. He must have heard wrong. Nobody was killing any patients at the hospital. I ain't got time for this. No disrespect. When he slammed the door in, in our face, uh, Investigator Curry and I just kind of looked at each other and said, huh, this isn't the place to start. We're going to have to find another, you know, uh, individual to talk to to see if we can, uh, you know, work this uh, from a different angle. Hospital administrators told police Evelyn Abrams could be Broden's lady friend. She often worked the graveyard shift with Efren Saldivar. She said there was no basis to uh, the rumors, that it was all just rumor, and that she had worked with Efren for a very long time, and she didn't believe that he was capable of doing anything like that. Abrams went on to explain she had been involved with both Jeff and Efren. To Anthony Fuchsia, this seemed to explain the entire situation. We've already had some questions. There was a consideration on our part that maybe um, the fact that Efren was having a sexual relationship with Evelyn may have been the motivation for Jeff to make the call and allege that Efren was doing this as a way of getting back at him. She told the detectives Jeff must have made up the story. We were of the opinion that it's, you know, it was just one of those vicious rumors that uh, sometimes occurs in the workplace. Maybe this was just all rumor and innuendo, and that, in fact, there was really no basis to the allegations. Investigators questioned Bob Baker. He insisted they meet outside. And we talked to him out in the parking lot at the hospital. He had told us that particular night about a prank that he had pulled on Efren along with another respiratory therapist. Baker told him about something strange he found one night while he was working the graveyard shift with Everett Weir. They decided to play a trick on one of the other respiratory therapists. They were rigging up his locker so that when he opened it, he would be covered with flour. They had taken some things from his locker and needed a place to stash them. Knowing Saldivar was not scheduled to work for a few days, they decided to borrow his locker. Inside, Baker noticed a plastic bag bulging with drugs. The bag of drugs was, was fairly huge, and it was full of uh, morphine and Demerol and Valium and bag, just stuff full of drugs. You could think at that point, well, maybe he's selling it to someone. And then I saw on the shelf two vials of succinylcholine. Succinylcholine chloride paralyzes the muscles and is used to make it easier to insert breathing tubes. It can be an extremely deadly drug if administered improperly. When you are paralyzed with succinylcholine, uh, you can still hear and think and feel. Um, and that's the reason we give the morphine or give them a sedative to put them into a dream state because it's uh, it, extremely terrifying. If you can imagine being completely paralyzed and you can see and you can hear and you can't move a muscle and your brain is completely working normal. When I saw the succinylcholine in the locker, it's obvious that he could not abuse this drug. This uh, could not be for personal use. He would kill himself. Baker told the officers he kept quiet about what he had found. Nobody outside of the doctor is supposed to be in possession of that. So when he saw that in Efren's locker, you know, it raised a red flag for him. But he told us he didn't go to anybody with that information because he was in Efren's locker. Um, kind of what he thought illegally. Suspicious of Baker's motives, the detectives went to Baker's supervisor. He said it was common knowledge Baker and Saldivar hated each other. He thought Baker made up the magic syringe rumor in an effort to ruin Saldivar's reputation. Do you think there's any truth to this? Well, there may have been some bias there on the part of Bob Baker as to the statements that he was giving us. You know, were they skewed a certain way to make to put effort in a bad light. You know, that's something that you take into consideration. The detectives hadn't uncovered much. Both Broden and Baker had motives for making up the rumor. 
And in the middle was Saldivar's co-worker on the graveyard shift, Evelyn Abrams. We were on this roller coaster ride from day one. We all kind of thought at that time that it was, it was probably just a dark rumor or it was uh, just someone's ploy to get money out of the hospital. The hospital had kept Saldivar off work for the entire week. But for detectives, the next step was clear. Based on everything, we're getting dead end, dead end, dead end. Um, no, it's not happening. And then, you know, ultimately we got down to, OK, let's bring in Efren. I'll bring him in. Well, Chief and I just spoke. It was time to pull in Saldivar. Right now, get him in here, get your list of questions. OK. They had no idea what surprises he had in store for them. I'd like to speak with Efren Saldivar, please. Yes, please. Rumors of murder at a California hospital sparked a police investigation. Let's do a quick All the rumors seemed to center on one respiratory therapist. To find out whether they were true, detectives decided to question Efren Saldivar. They asked him to come down to the station. At this hour, Detective Will Curry was the only investigator on duty. Mr. Saldivar. He told Saldivar about the rumors and asked him to take a polygraph test to clear the matter up. Why don't we just go and meet with Detective Youngblood? Irvin Youngblood was the polygraph examiner. Curry briefed him on the investigation. He had mentioned to me that they really didn't suspect that this was actually occurring, that this may have been someone who just didn't like him and was giving some false rumors. So they wanted to uh, put it to rest. Detective Curry left Saldivar alone with the polygraph examiner and went to the department's bug room, where he could monitor their conversation. Saldivar told Youngblood he didn't want to take the polygraph. It all of a sudden changed my perspective of things. At that point, I felt that there was something wrong with the person being that fearful of this. So I decided to step up my interview toward an interrogation. When I began to ask him, uh, did he kill the one? He was hesitant in his answer, and he said, I may have assisted in one way or the other, and that's why I'm afraid to take the polygraph. Then I asked him to explain to me what he meant by assisted. Saldivar began to tell Youngblood of an incident that occurred early in his career. <laughs> there was a patient, it was a cancer patient, and it had been determined that the patient was not going to survive, and the doctors had said they were going to take the patient off of the respirator, but they had not done so. He described to me as how he saw that the patient was still breathing. Um, the ventilator on patient three is still on. Saldivar said he informed one of the intensive care nurses. The nurse indicated she expected him to do something about it. So he decided to go in and literally cause the patient to suffocate. Saldivar told Youngblood it took the patient 15 minutes to die. Saldivar admitted there were other times when he helped patients to die. Youngblood pushed him to reveal the number of patients he had murdered. Saldivar thought it was less than 50, but was unsure of the exact number. And he later uh, said that it was could be up to around 90. And then he began to tell me that this had also occurred at two other hospitals that he had uh, moonlighted at. So the figures went up even more. And before it was over, he told me that it could be as many as 200. I was really amazed at it. It was really hard for me to keep my composure there, because I was just wondering, how could you have done such a thing? How many times did you 
The legal implications of Saldivar's confession soon hit Youngblood. I need to confer with one of the detectives and decide how we're going to continue with this. I was thinking that I need to find a way to get out of the room without losing rapport with this man and coming back and talking with him. Youngblood rushed from the room to find Curry waiting for him. The men needed to read Saldivar his rights, but they were afraid of spooking him and losing his cooperation. And I'll get the boys on the phone, bring him down. Okay, I'll show you. Detective Curry devised him of his constitutional rights. And surprisingly, he waived his rights and continued to talk to us. The investigators expected Saldivar to deny everything, but suddenly they had a serial murder confession. I don't care about that. I need you guys to understand. Detective Curry asked for help. Sergeant McKillop got the call. And it was Will Curry telling me that uh, we got a major problem and I better come back to work. Um, he said, this guy's rolling over. Detective Curry placed Saldivar under arrest. Detectives Fuchsia and McKillop arrived within the hour. They also called the district attorney and their chief. This was potentially the biggest case of their careers. If Saldivar's confession was true, then he had murdered more people than Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, and John Wayne Gacy combined. He said that he had been doing this. He killed his first patient approximately six months after he became a respiratory therapist, and he became a respiratory therapist in 1989. And remember, this interview that we were conducting with Saldivar was taking place in March of 1998, so we're looking at nine years of... Uh, you know, work that he had been doing at local hospitals. Saldivar's confession was shocking, almost unbelievable, according to Glendale detective Mario Yagoda. Did we have a person that was psychologically unstable, or did we truly have a murderer? And that's what made it difficult, even after his confession, because the confession, a lot of things he was saying, a lot didn't make sense, and a lot did make sense. According to the district attorney's office, the confession was not enough. To convict Saldivar of murder, they needed corroborating evidence. Well, the district attorney told us at this point all we had was a confession. We had no physical evidence. We had no identified victims. That there were a number of things that we had to do before we could even think about filing charges against Mr. Saldivar for murder. The detectives had only 48 hours to find hard evidence of Saldivar's crimes. Without it, they'd be forced to free him. If he was a serial killer, the investigators knew putting him on the streets could mean more innocent people would die. Rumors a serial murderer was killing patients in the ICU at a California hospital prompted a police investigation. They had their suspect, Efren Saldivar, behind bars. But to keep him there, they had only 48 hours to find physical evidence of his crimes. If they failed, Saldivar would walk free. The next morning, detectives arrived at Saldivar's home armed with a search warrant. They were looking for something to prove he had been poisoning patients. Saldivar lived with his parents. His older brother stood by, watching as they searched Efren's bedroom. The officers uncovered almost 100 pornography tapes, but they didn't find any paralyzing drugs. They did find Versid, a sedative often used in conjunction with a paralyzing drug called Pavulon. Detective John McKillop was disappointed when they didn't have better luck at the hospital. We didn't find Pavulon or succinylcholine chloride. And again, you know, we believe those drugs were used, so the only thing we could rely on um, 
was up to that point was the word of Bob Baker, who said he saw one of those drugs in his locker. But we didn't, we can't prove that he saw it because we never found it in his locker. They did find the printout of a blood gas test. The name on the bottom concerned police. One of the things that uh, sticks out in my mind was a um, paper that, uh, where he had listed himself as Dr. Jack Kevorkian um, on the paper. And obviously, we all know Dr. Kevorkian as an individual who believes in uh, assisted suicide. And that kind of struck us as odd and suspicious in and of itself that here we have somebody who's confessed to killing a number of patients, and he's got something in his locker at his workplace uh, identifying himself as Dr. Uh, Kevorkian. Doctor's name is not him. They didn't know the significance of their find, and it still didn't prove Efren killed anyone. Well, I understand all we have thus far is a confession. That's not sufficient in itself. We need additional substantiating information. Well, I got my investigator. Well, here they are now. What do you got, guys? Here's the oh, file. Well, he's locked up. He got his confession. As far as the law goes, you can't just uh, file criminal charges on somebody by what they say. And if it's a murder in particular, you have to have a body and be able to prove that the body was murdered. Um, in this case, you know, we didn't have a body. We had no proof that any person in particular was murdered. Got a confession. It's not enough by itself. The detectives had run out of time. Their 48 hours were up. They hadn't found enough evidence to formally charge Saldivar. The detectives would now have to put a confessed serial killer back on the street. I just started thinking about what we have to do now to uh, get the evidence. And uh, I could have killed a lot of people. How can you just let them go? The Glendale police needed to find some hard evidence to put Saldivar behind bars. But it now seemed that finding it would be nearly impossible. None of us had ever dealt with a serial killer uh, before. So it was something that took us all by surprise, along with the fact we have no evidence of uh, any homicides. Nothing. All we have is a confession. So there wasn't really anything tangible uh, for us to identify at that point. So it was, um, there was a bunch of different emotions uh, that were going through all of our minds. The detectives set up headquarters at a house on hospital property. They needed a secure place to conduct their investigation. Information leaks could prove fatal to building a case against Saldivar. We knew we were going to be under scrutiny from the public and from the press. And we also knew that we had a suspect out on the loose. He was no longer in custody. Uh, the progress of the case had to be kept very confidential from him, uh, from the news. We really needed to keep this one under wraps. And being in the police department with such a big investigation, there's no way we could have kept the information confidential. The officers started gathering the hospital records of Saldivar's patients. In them, they hoped to find evidence of murder. While detectives began looking into the past, they made sure not to lose track of their suspect. Saldivar could run at any moment, and investigators knew there would be nothing they could do to stop him. Efren Saldivar had admitted to killing as many as 100 patients at a California hospital. But without physical proof to back up his confession, detectives are forced to free him. Detective Randy Osborne conducted interviews with Saldivar's friends and family to see if they could shed any light on his guilt or innocence. I wanted to find out as much as I could about Efren Saldivar, dating back to his early childhood. Uh, I even went to his high school and got a copy of his yearbook, contacted schoolmates. Detectives tracked down one of Saldivar's high school girlfriends. Did you know Efren Saldivar? Well, yeah, I... She said her last conversation with Saldivar disturbed her. Tell me about it? They had a conversation about uh, their futures and what they wanted to do in life. And Efren at that time explained to her that uh, he was going to be participating in training for uh, respiratory therapy. Uh, she told him that she was impressed by that, that uh, that was a very noble and worthwhile profession. But then, the discussion took an unsettling turn. He mentioned to her that 
he wanted to get in this profession so he could help people, but also so he could help people by putting them out of their misery. And he explained that he had a hard time seeing people suffer and that he would not uh, have a problem with uh, killing people. Detective Osborne also interviewed Saldivar's co-workers. I learned that uh, Efren was a very quiet individual. Uh, most people that I spoke to uh, described him as standoffish and quiet. He kind of uh, existed in the shadows. Many of his co-workers described him as someone who was lazy and who was uncaring towards the people that he was being paid to take care of. A nurse who often worked with Saldivar spoke with the detectives. She told them a few years ago he did something she found very disturbing. She explained to us that she was working at the hospital with Efren and that there was a male patient in one of the rooms who was there uh, in, in very bad condition, uh, near death. And one night, uh, she heard an alarm go off in the patient's room. The patient had stopped breathing. Uh, Efren was in the room at that time. She started to work on the patient. She looked up at Efren and she stated, uh, can you come help me? This patient is flatlining. At that time, he raised his finger to his mouth and went shh as indicating to her don't do any work on the patient leave well enough alone and just let him pass away um, that shocked her and at that moment another nurse uh, came running into the room and they were able to resuscitate the, uh, the patient that really shook her um, she didn't want to work with uh, Saldivar after that at that time she said she felt she had to come forward with this information this information about Saldivar was troubling if he was poisoning patients, then investigators would have to try and understand why in order to find his potential victims. John Trestrail of the Regional Poison Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan, has devoted his life to the study of poison and those who use it. The angel of death would be the kind of person who plays God. Uh, he selects a group of people or an individual to eliminate them, and, and this power gives them some kind of a psychological rush to be able to say, I will take your life whenever I choose. These people tend to be what I call stealth killers. They come at you when your back's turned. They come at you in the dark. Poison is very hard to find. Unlike a gunshot wound where the bullet's entry is easily recognizable, if investigators don't suspect poison, they won't look for it. In a poisoning case, the unknown offender rate is 20 to 30 times higher than any other form of murder. What does that mean? It means that the chances are 20 to 30 times better that you'll get away with this than any other form of murder. Death by poison is particularly insidious. The victim has little chance of avoiding his fate. If you are the victim, You'll never see it coming. There's no defense. Breathe it, drink it, eat it, inject it. You'll never see it. The officers realized the prospect of finding poison was not good. They asked for help from many agencies who all told them they had little chance of finding paralyzing drugs. Detective Daniel Hinojosa. We had consulted uh, certain members of the FBI, and they had worked on similar cases, cases involving the drugs that we were looking for, involving the drug Pavilon and the drug succinylcholine chloride. It was their opinion that we needed to find a certain type of toxicologist who could assist us in extracting these samples because as far as the majority of the scientific and medical community was concerned, we weren't going to find these drugs. The detectives had no choice but to move ahead. If they ever hoped to find evidence of poison, it was now buried with the suspected victims. To find the victims, the detectives realized they would have to decipher thousands of complex medical charts. It was unfamiliar territory. When we got these medical records, you can imagine that uh, it's like sitting down and trying to read a language that you don't know how to speak. So all of us had to go out and buy medical dictionaries to understand a lot of what was being said in these medical charts in terms of uh, the treatments that the patients were receiving, the medical conditions that they were being treated for. The detectives began searching the charts for suspicious deaths. 
They consulted experts like Dr. Dale Isaev to help them identify the possible use of poison. What particularly I would look for, and I saw a number of examples of this, is that the patient had been admitted with a serious illness, had responded to treatment, and was doing relatively well. In review of the vital signs, the respiratory pattern, pulse, blood pressure, heart rhythm on the monitor appeared to be stable. And then the patient abruptly experiences a decrease in heart rate, where the heart would progressively decelerate or go slower over a relatively short time period, over a few minutes or so, where the patient would experience then full cardiac arrest with the heart activity just ceasing altogether. Notes made by the hospital staff provided initial clues. I then went back and very carefully looked at the nursing notes and tried to make a determination how had that patient been doing clinically if all the vital signs were stable, the nurses concluded the patient was doing well, and in fact, in some of the patients, it was anticipated that there was going to be an early discharge, uh, either home or to another facility, and then to see a note in the chart, patient found dead in bed, was something that caught my attention. Dr. Isaev told investigators to search for a reverse of the normal dying process. Normally, a patient's heart stops, then their respiration fails. But if a person is poisoned with a drug such as Pavulon, the reverse would occur. If an individual is given a paralyzing agent, one of the first things that happens is the patient or the individual is not able to breathe, or the impaired, there's impaired breathing function that very quickly leads to not being able to breathe. The heart will survive for a time, but then rapidly will slow down and the heart will stop. This type of death leaves behind disturbing clues, according to Mario Yagoda. We knew that these patients, there was a desire to live, so you see the racing of the heart. So in other words, like when a person's scared, uh, you know, the, the heart speeds up. So we'd see these speeding up of the heart uh, rhythms on the uh, EKG strips. And that's what we looked. We looked for these rhythms in the heart that would show some sort of fight or flight uh, syndrome. The detectives hoped information in patient medical charts would lead them to some proof of murder. The medical charts were only the first step to finding hard evidence, pavulon, or succinylcholine chloride in human flesh. We were ultimately going to have to exhume bodies. We were going to have to have specialists uh, come in to test uh, the tissue samples that we got during the autopsies to see whether or not these drugs were present, whether or not these drugs were even going to be detectable. The detectives had to find some way to narrow the potential victim list. So we decided that we would probably pick a number of about two years prior to the incident. Um, from that, we had to go through and compile every patient that had been, that had died at this hospital while Mr. Saldivar was on duty. Because more recent cases offered a better chance of finding traces of paralyzing drugs, they ignored Saldivar's first seven years. That brought their list down to 171. Of those, 54 were excluded because their remains were not available. That left 117 deaths to investigate. Each detective took a series of patients. If they found anything suspicious, they had to present it to the group. And we had to go to bat for them. We had to fight in a round table type of atmosphere where we all got together, we presented our cases, and we discussed our cases, our individual cases, and why it is we thought that they should be exhumed. And, of course, we couldn't exhume them all. When they found a patient who fit the profile, they posted their name on a board of possible victims to exhume. The list was beginning to grow. Deciding who to exhume was their first problem. Finding evidence of poison was their second. For help, they contacted Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory a high-tech government research facility near Oakland, California, 
It employs approximately 10,000 scientists doing chemistry, physics, nuclear, and forensics work. Brian Andreessen is director of the lab's Forensic Science Center. He was unsure he could help when he first learned of the drugs the police were searching for. I looked up these drugs and everything that had been known about them. And it was interesting, a lot of these drugs, of course, to be used in people, have to be tested and tested. And the data on that testing has to be published. And I read all those papers. But no one had really taken these drugs out of a healthy human and then analyzed it after someone had died and been buried for a long time, because those work, that kind of work had not been done with these drugs to any great extent. Andreessen also learned succinylcholine chloride, the drug spotted in Saldivar's locker, quickly breaks down into chemicals that are naturally found in the body. Their best bet was to test for pavulon, but no test existed that could detect pavulon in decomposing human tissue. He would have to develop one. I wasn't that confident because it never really had been done before, but I was willing to give it a very substantial try to see if I could develop a protocol that would work. On March 27, 1998, the story of Saldivar's suspension and the possible murders broke in the media. The community was outraged at the possibility their relatives had been murdered in their hospital beds. The phones were ringing off the hook at the station, as well as the offsite where we were now housed at, with people wanting to know whether or not their loved one was a victim of Saldivar's. Officers used the information provided by family members to aid their investigation. The inquiries that we received from the families helped us in two ways. One is we went back and looked at those particular cases. If they felt they were suspicious, maybe it warranted some additional research on our part. If this case is suspicious, well, this warrants an additional interview with this family member. What did you see? Where were you? Where were you at bedside at the time that your loved one passed away? In the midst of the media frenzy, officers watching Saldivar's house noticed he had not returned for several days. At that point, I believe he was still in hiding. We didn't know his whereabouts. So we did lose track of him for a while uh, after he was uh, released from custody. If Saldivar had fled, the detectives knew they'd have little chance of ever putting their suspected serial killer behind bars. In Glendale, California, outside of Los Angeles, a small hospital was experiencing a rash of unexplained deaths. Patients like Trisha Johnson were fine one moment, and then suddenly went into an unexplained crisis. Trisha was in full arrest. The trauma team rushed to her room. But despite their efforts, they could not save her. The staff began to suspect someone in the hospital was causing the patients to die. They started to point the finger at one another. When the employees began to find drugs hidden in strange places, the suspicion grew. All the rumors seemed to point to one of the respiratory therapists, a man named Efren Saldivar. He was questioned by the police and shocked them with a confession. But without any evidence, they had to release him. To find proof of murder, police turned to thousands of complicated medical records that spanned over nine years. Glendale police detective Daniel Hinojosa. Because of the amount of potential victims involved, we were talking about probably the largest murder case this city has ever seen in its history. It might have made him probably the largest mass murderer in the history of the United States, for that matter. The media descended on Saldivar's home. His brother told reporters Efren had gone to stay with relatives. He also told reporters Efren was innocent. Larry Schlegel saw the news report on Saldivar's confession. Schlegel's mother, Eleonora, had died of respiratory failure at the hospital more than a year earlier. They had listed a number of conditions that seemed common to the people he had, had claimed to have killed. She was there in the time frames. 
name is Larry Schwager. Larry called the hotline and told investigators his mother fit the criteria they outlined. Schlegel told police how his mother's frequent hospital visits were a matter of increasing concern for him. It's always a scary thing when she began one of these bouts and, and need to be rushed in, but once the, uh, the medication kicked in and, and her lungs cleared up, then she was always ready to go home and, and get on with the rest of her life. She had come down with pneumonia and was having trouble breathing. She was resting comfortably when Larry came to visit her on New Year's Eve. My son and I stopped by to visit with her, and, and we were there for about an hour. And she was uh, sitting up and, and breathing about as well as she could and, and able to carry on a conversation for, for all of that hour. Eleonora was looking forward to going home. But the next day, Pasadena would be crowded with visitors for the Tournament of Roses parade in the Rose Bowl football game. Places a zoo for at least 24 hours in advance. So the doctors figured, we don't even have to think about this one. Um, you know, it's New Year's Eve. We'll decide after New Year's Day about a release date. They decided it would be okay for her to stay in the hospital a couple more days. When Eleanor Schlegel checked in, she had asked that she be classified as a DNR, or do not resuscitate. On the early morning of January 2nd, her vital signs were stable and she was planning to go home. Later that morning, the nurse returned to check on her. She had stopped breathing, and no pulse could be detected. Go blue! Go blue! Got it? All right, let's go, let's go. All right. The last time I talked to my mom, she had been well down the road of recovery, and it just hit you like a ton of bricks. To Larry, the possibility that his mother was poisoned seemed impossible to believe. We hear all sorts of things on the evening news that, you know, happened to other people. And that was basically my reaction. Oh, this is, this is something that happens to other people. The detectives told Schlegel they would check into his mother's case. The police hotline was jammed with hundreds more calls just like Larry's. In the first three days, police received more than 230 messages from worried relatives whose family members had died at Ecovera. The media frenzy sent the hospital into damage control. They suspended the entire 44-member respiratory department, including Bob Baker. The atmosphere in the hospital changed almost immediately. And all of a sudden, you had you know, a massive investigation. It, it changed everything at that point. Then it, it was like a tornado hit the hospital. 39 employees were eventually cleared. But Evelyn Abrams and three others remained on suspension. The following week, Saldivar emerged from hiding. Appearing on nationwide television, he told two news magazine shows that he had made up the confession. The task force was shocked. Saldivar claimed he lied to the police, making up the confession because he was depressed and he wanted to die. So his rationale was that if I confess to killing a number of people, that I'll be found guilty of murder in a trial, sentenced to death by the state, and the state can do what I couldn't do for myself. I told you that. I didn't have the guts. Right here. You see this? Saldivar was taking his case to the public. Detective Hinojosa recalls the frustration the officers felt. Because I was being accused. Had this just been some kind of a sick joke that he had been playing on us by, by making this story up, we as investigators wanted to get to the truth. And if that was the truth, then we were obliged to take that information and figure out which side was the truth. Did he do it or did he not do it? 
The task force watched with frustration as Saldivar recanted his confession before an audience of millions. The heat was now on to prove that he was an angel of death. I wanted to die. A confessed serial killer was on the loose, but detectives had no idea who he may have murdered. It was a whodunit reversed, according to Glendale police detective Daniel Hinojosa. What we have here is a backwards case. Usually we have a victim, and from that victim, we go forward and try and find the suspect. In this instance, we had a suspect and no victims. And so that is completely the opposite of what we're used to handling. The police's prime suspect in the case was a respiratory therapist named Efren Saldivar. As police narrowed the list of Saldivar's suspected victims, they kept an eye on him. He was hiding out at the home of a former co-worker. The detectives also consulted criminal psychologist Chris Mohandi. They hoped his experience with other serial murderers would help them identify Saldivar's victims. He told the detectives they should not believe all of Efren's confession. They may use substances other than the ones that they say that they're using. So you may need to expand your search beyond the obvious into a much larger victim pool. We learned from other cases that these perpetrators will choose victims who are not just on their shift, who are not just fitting their criteria, but they will actually expand their hunt to other individuals. Dr. Mohandi gave the detectives a sketch of Saldivar's psychological makeup. My initial impression of Saldivar was an everyday guy who's somewhat socially awkward, a little geeky, um, doesn't quite fit in any particular group, desperately hungers to be liked and recognized by other people. Mohandi looked into Saldivar's past and found he chose his profession to counteract his sense of inferiority. It's interesting to look at why Saldivar became a respiratory therapist. Somebody came into the supermarket where he was working, had the uniform of the respiratory therapist, complete with stethoscope, I guess, and he was attracted to it because it looked medical, it looked official, it looked like it had authority and power imbued in it. Mohandi also warned the detectives that given the opportunity, Saldivar would commit more murders. And once they get a taste of it by actually doing, it's like you can't put the cork back on the bottle. The genie's out of the bottle and you can't put him back in because then no fantasy is going to really measure up to actually doing it. The detectives continued to talk with everyone who worked with Saldivar. They hoped that someone had seen something specific they could use to identify a body to be exhumed. In his confession, Saldivar mentioned his co-worker, Evelyn Abrams, knew about the killings and tried to stop him. What did you do after Investigators you granted her limited immunity in return for any information she could provide. At that time right there. She essentially came clean with us at this point and told us that, yeah, she knew that something was going on and that she was aware of a particular time when Efren came to her and said that he had inadvertently given a patient uh, pavulon. Investigators hoped she could point them to a specific patient, but Evelyn couldn't recall anything about the person. I don't remember. Old, I didn't. young, male, female, anything? I didn't look at the patient. I she did say that Salivar told her about his criteria for deciding if a patient should die. And when he targeted one of her own patients, Evelyn warned him to leave the woman alone. Check on her. Make sure she's okay. Efren, leave her alone. Leave her alone. So there's no Evelyn's admission was incriminating, but it still didn't point investigators to any victims. But one nurse did remember a disturbing incident involving a patient named Linda Shirovsky. She had trouble breathing and was placed on oxygen. The nurse asked Saldivar to collect a blood sample.
couple of minutes after she left Shirovsky's room, the nurse said she saw Saldivar come out and call a code blue. The nurse was surprised to find the patient totally unresponsive. Shirovsky had suddenly stopped breathing, and her muscles were flaccid, as if she were paralyzed. And yet the monitor showed that her heart was still beating strongly. Shirovsky's family had authorized a meds-only code. The doctors could medicate the patient, but they were forbidden to attempt any resuscitation. It took Linda Shirovsky 40 minutes to die. The nurse was confused because the woman had been responding well to treatment. Investigators placed Shirovsky on their list for exhumation. The detectives continued to monitor Saldivar's whereabouts as he changed jobs. They still feared he might try to flee. We believed he was thinking of taking off, and he had made a statement again through the surveillance. We saw him talking to somebody at the credit union when he made a withdrawal, and, and upon follow-up, the credit union said he made a comment about you know, fleeing the country. So that was a real concern all the way through, and that was another hidden pressure to get to the bottom of this case. We didn't want to lose him. Finally, find the evidence, and he's gone. Helping to find the evidence was Brian Andreessen of Lawrence Livermore's Forensic Science Center. He was struggling to create a test to find pavulon in exhumed human tissue. There was a, a number of people who voiced opinions that this could be a waste of money, could be a waste of time, because the drugs are so low concentration. It was a long shot. Andreessen knew pavulon could sometimes be detected in urine. He planned to process tissue samples from the exhumed bodies to make a urine-like substance, which could be tested with a mass spectrometer, a machine that determines the makeup of a substance by measuring the weights of its elements. He had no idea whether it would work. He had dedicated nearly a year trying to perfect the test. I got involved with it, and I started just putting in the hours and going on and on, and it would be 16-hour days, day after day with failure. I mean, it's, it's kind of depressing because I couldn't get anything to work. I almost abandoned my house. I was like living in the lab. The, my neighbors were worried because the lawn was never cut. Things weren't picked up. Then the sacrifice began to pay off when Andreessen looked for help from a very unlikely source. We have a big program on detection of chemical weapons and uh, their breakdown products in the environment. And I took one of these, what's called the solid phase extraction cartridges. They didn't work for chemical warfare agents. I says, well, let me just try this. And sure enough, all of a sudden, it trapped Pavilon. It was like one of those eureka moments. Andreessen had found his test. Now he just needed the police to find the victims. Saldivar's victims, however, remained mute and unknown. John Schwartz, who died after mysteriously falling out of bed, may have been one of them. His family filed a lawsuit, convinced Schwartz had died by Saldivar's hand. He admitted to murdering many people. And with all of the discrepancies with my grandfather's records and with him being on shift and dying so quickly, my grandfather was checked on at one moment, I believe it was like 3.30, and then he was deceased a half an hour later, a half hour to 40 minutes later. And that was just when the attending physician declared him dead because they had to find someone to declare him dead. The whole thing was pretty suspicious. You know, he gave us reason to be suspicious of him by admitting to so many things. The task force followed up every lead. Detectives went to meet with Larry Schlegel. His mother died mysteriously while under Saldivar's care. I got a call from some detectives in the police department, and uh, their questions were much more specific, much more about you know what had been done with my mom's body, had she been cremated, had she been buried. Eleonora Schlegel had been buried. The detectives notified Larry his mother was a prime candidate for exhumation. 
By the middle of March 1999, the investigators had identified 20 possible victims. That was the largest number of bodies they could exhume. At the original time of death, doctors had declared that every one of those deaths was due to natural causes. McKillop and his detectives would have to prove them wrong. It was difficult for the victims' families, but Detective Mario Yagoda knew they understood the need for the exhumations. The majority of them uh, did cooperate and uh, were willing to help us. They, too, were looking for the truth. Because keep in mind, some of those family members had that suspicion all along. Uh, they knew uh, something just wasn't right when their loved one passed away. One of the first to be exhumed was the body of Myrtle Brower. The casket was enclosed in a burial vault made of concrete. A crew from the cemetery hoisted it from the ground. The team took soil samples for testing. They doubted pavillon would be present in the soil, but they could not afford to overlook anything. They anticipated Saldivar's defense attorney may argue that chemicals had seeped into the bodies from the surrounding earth. Detective Anthony Fuchsia made certain the officers were careful not to make any mistakes during the exhumations. We used the same uh, coroner's investigator each time we did an exhumation. We used the same coroner and pathologist to do the autopsies every time. Uh, the same uh, forensics technicians from our department do um, any collecting of samples of, of water or what have you at the grave sites. Um, we had the system down and we used the same people every time just for purposes of chain of custody so that an issue wouldn't arise as to how uh, things were collected. Cemetery workers removed the casket from the burial vault and loaded it into a van for the trip to the coroner's office. Brower's body had been buried for nearly two years. To positively identify the remains, the task force supplied the coroner with hospital x-rays, photo identification, and dental records. When all was ready, the investigators broke the casket's seal. They checked the mortuary band to positively identify the body. The remains were surprisingly well preserved. Dr. Andreessen had warned them that if the remains were too decomposed, finding pavillon would be virtually impossible. The autopsies were unsettling for Detective Hinojosa. These were people that I felt I had almost come to know. At this point in the investigation, I had done a lot of research on these particular people. I had spoken to their family members. I had seen photographs of them. I knew about where they had lived, who they were, what their jobs or careers were. And to see these people now in this way is definitely difficult, to say the least. I could only hope at that time that it was, it meant something, that it was not all for naught. Appears to be an elderly female, Caucasian. Dr. Andreessen directed the coroner to remove the tissues that would best reveal traces of pavillon. Each tissue sample went in a separate jar, and they all went into a box for transport to the Forensic Science Center. The officers continued to carefully handle all the evidence they collected. Our whole case hinges on these samples. We couldn't afford to have these things out of our sight for even a minute. I mean, these things had to be accounted for at all times. From the minute they were extracted from the body, to the minute they arrived at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, we had to be able to account for them. There was just no exception to that. Anything less could have meant our whole case. The next morning, McKillop and Curry made the drive. 
334 miles up Interstate 5 along California's grapevine to preserve the chain of custody and deliver the tissue samples to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Technicians there took custody of the autopsy samples. They'd spent months waiting for this moment. But Dr. Andreessen's test was unproven. If it failed, all the painstaking investigative work would be for nothing, and confessed serial killer Efren Saldivar would remain a free man. To catch suspected serial killer Efren Saldivar, investigators must reopen the graves of 20 of his possible victims. It was their only hope for finding the physical evidence to put him behind bars. That evidence, a paralyzing drug called pavulon, must be extracted from the exhumed bodies by an experimental procedure. If it fails, the investigators will have no way to prove their suspect is a murderer. Glendale police officers hand-delivered autopsy samples to forensics expert Dr. Andreessen. He immediately began processing the exhumed tissue. He started by grinding up the samples into a paste-like substance. I first just looked at kidney and the lung tissues, those tissues that receive a lot of blood supply. Because theoretically, at the moment of death, the blood is still circulating greatly in the bodies, and the lung tissues would have great circulation. We can confirm that the drug's present. Andreessen filtered it through a polymer that would stick to the drug. He then tested the samples using a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which can detect compounds weighing less than a billionth of a gram. What a mass spectrometer does, it actually weighs molecules. And I know the exact weight of pavulon. I present this unknown sample to this mass spectrometer. And it gives me the weights of all the chemicals. And from that, I can say, sure enough, I do or do not have pavulon in this sample. In the first couple of samples, I didn't see anything in them at all. And initially, these samples were coming back negative, And I thought, well, maybe there has not been a crime committed, that these patients died naturally. But then, Andreessen discovered the evidence the investigators so desperately needed. One night, I was working up the samples, started looking at the data, and there was pavulon, the first time I'd seen it in a real exhumed tissue sample. It, I wouldn't say took my breath away, but I looked at it, I said, is this true? This is true, there is pavulon in this patient. Six weeks after the first specimens were delivered, detectives got the call they had been waiting for. Andreessen had a solid hit. In liver tissue from one of the exhumed bodies, he had found traces of pavulon. The task force was elated. After more than a year of investigation, their hard work had finally paid off. Then they discovered a problem. The victim's medical records showed he had received two milligrams of pavulon in the course of his treatment at the hospital. It had been given to him on August 7, 1997, eight days before he died. Detective McKillop was losing his patience. We went from shock and happiness, jubilant, to here we go again. Every time we get a piece of evidence, there's something that pulls us back and says that's not going to be good enough. While the drug would have metabolized in 20 hours, long before the man's death, Saldivar's attorney might argue this is why it was in his system. If the team guessed wrong and Pavulon failed to show up in any other bodies, their case against Saldivar would collapse. The exhumations continued. Bob Baker had told investigators he suspected Saldivar used his magic syringe on Sarah Ascari. Based on this information, Ascari's body had been slated for exhumation. The cemetery workers found water in the burial vault, so detectives took samples of it for analysis. The captain of the department called the lead detective, John McKillop, in to account for his progress or the lack of it. 
McKillop's team had spent the past year and a half working the case, but they still had not found anything proving Saldivar's guilt. It was all about finding the truth. I mean, if we could prove that it didn't happen, that was success, just like proving that it did happen. What everybody was afraid of is una being unable to prove that it happened, because what does that mean? It means we can't prove it happened, and we can't prove it didn't happen. What's going on? I've had to the captain informed McKillop that the brass was losing their patience. We're a department of uh, 220 sworn police officers with a budget that's not the same as a major, uh, you know, multi-thousand person police department. So we really knew we were draining our uh, resources financially. The lab work alone had cost $150,000. The task force needed hard evidence soon, or the department would shut them down. The success of the entire investigation now rested on Dr. Andreessen's shoulders. He needed to find some evidence of the drug soon, or suspected murderer Efren Saldivar would remain free. Detectives in Glendale, California, exhumed the remains of people they suspected were murdered in an area hospital. A laboratory detected traces of a paralyzing drug in one of the bodies, but the drug had been legitimately administered by the hospital. They had identified a suspected serial killer, but still had not located any of his victims. Investigators got a break when Dr. Andreessen at Lawrence Livermore Labs started getting hits. Sarah Ascari, and Linda Sharofsky. The results were overwhelming, he told the task force. He had found massive amounts of pavulon in the women's lungs, kidneys, bladder, heart tissue, liver, and brain. Investigators finally had hard, irrefutable physical evidence to confirm Saldivar's confession. They were ready to arrest Saldivar on three counts of murder. But investigators wanted to make sure they gathered all the evidence they could. The exhumations continued. Havilan turned up in three more patients, Jorge Agata, Eleonora Schlegel, and Myrtle Brower. Six out of the 20 bodies exhumed had traces of the paralyzing drug. We expected we would be lucky if we got one. So now we're getting five, six. We were starting to think we've got one of the biggest serial killers of all time. They now had potentially linked Saldivar to six counts of murder. The prosecutor wanted to make sure there was no other explanation for Pavilon being in the bodies. To solidify their case, the detectives obtained all the medical records they could find for all six patients going back over their entire lifetimes. They examined them for any traces of Pavilon. The patient's medical history showed that Eleonora Schlegel had received Pavulon on two occasions in 1983 and 1984. Aside from her and the first patient, none of the others had ever received Pavulon as part of their legitimate medical treatment. The only explanation for Pavulon being in their systems was Saldivar's magic syringe. The detectives believed they had a rock-solid case but their optimism wasn't shared by the DA's office. The prosecutor had some discouraging news. The wrongful death lawsuit brought by John Schwartz's family had been thrown out. The judge had cited a lack of evidence. The ruling only exacerbated the detectives' fears. They went back to review all the charts of every patient in the hospital, all 450 beds on the nights the six patients had died. They wanted to make sure Saldivar was not actually treating someone else at the times he was accused of committing murder. He could have been present at each murder. After years of searching for evidence of murder, the investigators finally had enough to make an arrest. On January 9th, 2001, the detectives gathered and set out in unmarked cars. Police had kept a close watch on Saldivar. They knew his schedule for every minute of the day.
They were waiting for him as he left for work that morning. As he left his house, the officers latched onto Saldivar's bumper. It had been two and a half years since Saldivar's confession. They almost had him in their grasp, but all they could do was wait for the right moment to arrest the serial killer. They had no idea what he might do when they finally pulled him over, and they couldn't take any chances. When Saldivar turned onto a deserted road, the officers made their move. He didn't fight as the officers surrounded him. The murderer of defenseless people was now defenseless himself. Detective Fuchsia cuffed Saldivar. A lot of police officers don't get to say they, they bagged a serial killer during their career. And, you know, there was a lot of times during the investigation where I didn't think this case was go going anywhere, and there was a lot of frustration and we thought this day would never come. And when it was finally there, and to be able to place the handcuffs on him, it was a good feeling. It was one of satisfaction. Saldivar's freedom had come to an end. As the detectives read him his rights, the investigator's long journey to capture Saldivar was finally over. If you decide to answer questions now without your lawyer being present, you have the right to change your mind at any time and request that your lawyer be present before you answer any further questions. You understand these rights? Check the contents of Bob over there. Saldivar had taken the lives of countless patients. For nine years, he had gotten away with murder. But now, the law would call him to account for his crimes. Now the officers hoped they could discover his motives for killing. Detectives brought Saldivar into the station to question him one more time. We brought him to the interview room. When he got in there, it wasn't about, so we want to ask you, did you do it? It was about, we know you did it. Let's get over that hump. Let's talk about why. And, you know, let's see if we can put an end to this and maybe keep us from exhuming another 20 bodies and disrupting another, you know, 20 uh, victims' families' lives. Detective McKillop told Saldivar six of his patients had tested positive for Pavulon. I just told him it's over. We're here to find out why you did it, not if you did it. You know, if you're going to give us that baloney, then we might as well end this conversation. He said, you know, we have really low um, volume type way, he just basically said that uh, he did it because of workload, that uh, too many patients and too much work, and he was doing it to just, you know, thin out the crowd. But this second confession conflicts with what police psychologist Chris Mohandi believes was Saldivar's true motives for killing. At the core of his being is some sort of deep-seated sense of inadequacy or inferiority which killing remedies, that the power that one experiences, the omnipotence that one experiences by having control over life and death is what would drive him to do these kinds of things. The omnipotence, control over life and death is the perfect antidote for a person who feels insignificant, perhaps unloved, powerless, out of control. What better way to wield control than to have the ultimate control over life and death, to be almost godlike. 
Detectives called the relatives of Saldivar's victims. It was devastating for them to finally learn their loved ones had been murdered. But with Saldivar's arrest, they would at last find justice. By his own account, Saldivar was near the top of any list of serial killers. He told detectives that he killed on impulse, and after he did it, he never thought about it again. This explanation rings true to police psychologist Chris Mohandi. I don't think that Saldivar truly felt a sense of guilt or remorse. I believe that to this day he feels justified in what he did, but not in a mean-spirited way. He truly thinks he was being helpful. The district attorney's office began building their case, according to prosecutor Albert McKenzie. The key to a case like this is basically what I call connecting the dots. Uh, there's no one thing that is going to convict the defendant. It's the totality of the circumstances. It's all the little bits of evidence that you have to present to uh, a grand jury or a jury. The prosecution team was concerned with the level of scientific detail they would have to present to a jury, according to prosecutor Carla Curlin. In this case, it may have been too technical, and the jury just couldn't grasp the concept. And it also was, we were using established technology, but it's not technology that people are generally familiar with, but we were using it in a new way. And so a good defense attorney will always put a spin on that to make it look like it's new, never been done before, experimental, can't be trusted, that kind of thing. At his trial, Saldivar shocked everyone when he pled guilty in order to avoid the death penalty. Larry Schlegel was in the courtroom that day. Given what he had done to my mother and to the other six named victims, and he had injected them with Pavulon, and Pavulon is one of the drugs used in, in administering capital punishment in the state of California. It would have been some poetic justice, I suppose, for him to have gotten similar treatment. The judge gave Saldivar six consecutive life sentences and 15 more years for the attempted murder of Gene Coyle. Despite the prosecution's overwhelming evidence, Albert McKenzie felt it was best to accept Saldivar's plea. Uh, let's bring resolution to all of these people. If ever we got the death penalty on Mr. Saldivar, uh, you know, that might be years away. And the people who cared most about the victims may no longer be around. If we can bring closure to the victims, if we can get Mr. Saldivar off to prison, for uh, six life in prison without the possibility of parole sentences and one life sentence on top of that, uh, you know, we've accomplished some justice here. Ecovera Medical Center has since tightened their controls, but Bob Baker believes Saldivar has done irreparable damage. This sacred institution was in a, a large sense a playground to Efren. Uh, he obviously didn't hold life sacred. He violated this institution and it was felt all over the world, I think, that you, you take somebody like that and um, for them to feel that they can do this is, is just, uh, it's unspeakable. Investigators may never know the actual number of Saldivar's victims. The six murders he's known to have committed occurred in his last year at the hospital. I think Saldivar killed hundreds. Um, and again, it's based on his own words and just doing the math. If we had that many in one year, and in, in his own words, it was a slow year, he must have killed hundreds of people. I know that we found over 50 suspicious cases in that uh, final year of employment. So it's not like I'm just taking his word for it. I think our own investigation proved that he killed a heck of a lot more than, uh, than what we were able to prove. But thanks to the tireless work of police and scientists alike, they do know that this angel of death will never claim any more victims.